I just wanted to start by by saying that right now, a country, uh, a quarter of all countries in the world are currently experiencing a debt crisis. Debt is a fundamental global justice issue. As economist Jason Hickel says, when a global South country is under foreign debt, this is debt owed in a currency that it does not control. In order to pay that debt and to pay interest on that debt, it is forced to export more of its resources, more of its embodied labor, more of its energy, etc. Debt is basically a claim on global South resources and labor, end quote. Through that process, debt inhibits countries' ability to invest in healthcare, education, decent housing, or address the huge inequalities present in adapting to the impacts of the climate and ecological crisis. But we know that debt isn't an accident. And as our speakers will explain, it is a central feature of our rigged global economy stemming from centuries of colonialism. It protects the interests of, and wealth of rich nations and powerful corporate elites in global North countries. It's interesting that we are hosting this uh, webinar and discussion on October 13th, one day um, um, after we marked 530 years of the resistance to colonialism, the, the, the 530 years since Christopher Columbus um, landed in the Americas and unleashed the, the colonial violence and the imperial violence that um, um, is present today in, in the global capitalist economic system. As Thomas Sankara, the Marxist revolutionary from Burkina Faso taught us in the 1980s, there is a form of neocolonial control over the global South. It's a necessary component in keeping the global capitalist imperial machine intact. And that is why War on One is taking part in this global week of action for justice and debt cancellation. We're calling for immediate debt cancellation from all lenders. We've signed the Asian, Asia People's Movement on Debt and Development Statement, which we will share in the chat right now. And we will also share some links for Twitter messages you can send right, uh, at this moment to G20 finance ministers, uh, as well as to the IMF and the World Bank who are meeting right now in Washington. The cancellation of debt is one of the most urgent actions to achieve an internationalist uh, global Green Deal. The framework for the systemic changes needed to uproot injustice and meet the multiple crises of climate, poverty, and inequality with the ambition and urgency required. This year, we have seen the news headlines of Sri Lanka's economic crisis with skyrocketing inflation and widespread scarcity of everyday essentials such as food, fuel, and medicines. Foreign and private debt is key to understanding this crisis. In 2021, Sri Lanka's foreign debt was equal to 64.2% of its GDP, and its total debt amounted to a staggering 190% of its GDP. Sri Lanka was unable to meet its debt repayments and recently defaulted on 51 billion US dollars worth of debt. Negotiations with the IMF have taken place with the Sri Lankan government, but many have decried the lack of public information and involvement of civil society in those negotiations. In Pakistan, Servicing international debt will take $18 billion away from the government's budget as it tries to rebuild homes, schools, and hospitals destroyed by the recent devastating flooding. The result of a climate and ecological crisis, Pakistan has little responsibility in creating in the first place. So to help us unpack this moment of, from the perspectives of Sri Lanka and Pakistan, and to illustrate why debt justice is so vital and urgent, we're really honored and thankful to welcome Bilal Sahur and Aisha Ahmad from Labour Relief Campaign in Pakistan, and from Sri Lanka, the economist uh, Danusha Patirana and President of Commercial and Industrial Workers Union, Swastika Arulingam. I'm gonna now, now hand over to um, Bilal and Aisha who will um, make their interventions. Bilal and, and Aisha, welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you, Seb, and thank you to Warren Vaughan for this uh, important panel discussion around debt cancellation. I am from Pakistan. The city I come from is Lahore, and it is the city which has already started seeing the onslaught of the annual smoke that we experience for three months in the winter. 
Smog is a bizarre combination of uh, smoke and fog that we annually experience. And this is a situation where the quality of the air becomes uh, so toxic that you cannot think of breathing the air without causing some serious long-term or short-term damage to the to the uh, to the respiratory system, um, and this is precisely one of the uh, important demonstrations, manifestations of the ecological crisis that the country is experiencing uh, around this year. There are many, many, many manifestations, but uh, during the winter, smog is one of the central ones, and this makes the case for debt cancellation uh, an important one. Uh, but before I come to the ecological crisis. I just want to take forward the introduction uh, that uh, uh, the introductory impetus that Seb gave in the start, and how the uh, how the debt crisis is very much related to history of colonialism. Um, it's important to sort of set the record straight in the start to understand uh, what debt crisis is and how uh, in how inevitably intertwined it is with the colonial history uh, so uh, it will be very difficult to oppose this proposition that the major ambition driving the colonial empire was a kind of uh, operation uh, focused on three axes uh, the continuous colonial expansion the economic exploitation and political repression of which the economic exploitation becomes central. Take the example of, uh, for instance, the United India, where the uh, East, where the British East India Company set its foot in the first quarter of the 18th century, and in a matter of just a few decades, uh, uh, developed a very political outlook, soon to be uh, developing an outlook that sort of takes over the country in its entirety and makes it a colony and then rules the United India for over 200 years. Um, there's this uh, brilliant uh, economist, Utsa Patnaik. She recently uh, came up with this revealing in 2018 with a, with a, with a, with a fascinating book where she shares that uh, the, the British empire in India siphoned out a startling 45 trillion dollars from India during the period of uh, 1735 to 1938. And how exactly British did that? I mean, she makes a, I mean, there's a layer and layer of layers and layers of arguments, but very briefly speaking, uh, what they actually did was uh, they started uh, charging, they started exporting the Indian produce, the textile, the spices, and many other uh, agricultural produce to the European nations at an exorbitant price. That's one. And secondly, they bought these produce from the local Indian producers, from the taxes collected from the Indian producers. So it's a, it's a, it's a double jeopardy. Uh, one, the, the the buying takes place on the grounds of the taxes collected from the Indians, and then the profit is made off those buying by exporting those producers to the rich countries in the uh, in the European continent. Uh, but that's just one of the many manifestations of how the crisis of debt is very much related to our colonial history. And not just colonial history, I think the post-colonial epoch has been no different. Uh, the mechanisms might have been different. At times, they have been direct military interventions into the erstwhile colonized regions. At other moments, they have been levers of uh, economic and political leverages through which the global north uh, continued to sustain its dominion in the vast lands of the global south. Um, many, many examples that can possibly come to the mind. Many of the wars that have been fought in the late 20th century and continues to be fought by the international powers in the 21st century. Um, the example of Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, uh, including Pakistan and the, and, the, and the bordering countries in South Asia, many of the countries in Middle East, Africa, Latin America. 
So by and large, we are in a situation where the, um, I mean, this is clearly not to exempt the local political agents of responsibility. Of course, they have been equally complicit, but this is rather to take a systematic view of the situation of the international relations of imperialism, where vast communities of the global South have been at the mercy of how international imperial relations play themselves out in a particular epoch in history. So whether it's the it's the colonial period or the post-colonial period, the subjugation has been more or less the same. Uh, um, in fact, I um, wrote it to uh, as as part of an article the the other uh, the other week that the that the post in the post-colonial is as much post as the post in post-fascism or post-authoritarianism or post-fundamentalism. Post, I mean, the colonial epoch is an epoch that refuses to be an epoch in history. It is a permanence that refuses to fade into the past. Uh, and, and, uh, and this is precisely uh, uh, what is the situation of many of the countries in the global south, but I will also briefly uh, link this situation up to the uh, to the idea uh, that uh, how we can move forward from here uh, in our pursuit of that cancellation. And I'm I, and I want to make this clear that we must not fight this as a legal battle or as a battle that's fought within the bureaucratic chambers or the chambers of the international organizations, because that will be a situation which will hamper us develop a trans-regional sense of solidarity, uh, a sense of solidarity precisely primarily amongst the people in, in Europe and North America, uh, because otherwise it will just be an exercise between parliamentarians and bureaucratic agencies and so on, and the people will just be left out of the process. And here is the question of internationalism that becomes central, the question of internationalist left politics that, that, that makes itself, that becomes, uh, that comes to the, to the center. Um, I must read a couple of lines here that I wrote as part of an essay. Uh, lately, it is yet to be published. Uh, and because we are talking about the role of internationalism uh, in left politics and the missing uh, perspective on the front of left politics in many of the countries in the global north, uh, this is a situation which indicates a broader problem facing the 21st century left project. On the one hand, the political economic independence struggles of peripheral countries, such as those in the global south, are directly targeted toward the outlets of global capitalism, the international financial institutions. On the other hand, the movements in the core countries are systematically forced to de-internationalize their struggles. While Slavoj Žižek, uh, the Slovenian philosopher, is right in insisting that internationalism is a key component of any project of radical emancipation, we need to understand where internationalism is missing. Since the left's project in peripheral countries is inherently opposed to global capitalism, it is the movements in the core countries that face the greatest inertia to embrace internationalism. I think it's extremely important to draw our attention to this very point uh, uh, that why internationalism is central to our pursuit of debt crisis, uh, to the cancellation uh, of the debt of the third world. And I reiterate that the left politics, the progressive politics, the large amounts of movements in the global south are intrinsically internationalist because they are structurally tied to the global international financial institutions, the IMFs of the world, the world banks of the world, the donors in the global north and so on. So their politics is just intrinsically internationalist in character uh, because their economy, their political independence is very much tied to them eventually being freed up from these, uh, from, from these uh, strictures. It is the politics of the left in the global north 
that is missing the internationalist character. I'm not sort of saying out loud that, you know, the, uh, the, the trans-regional solidarity is completely missing. Of course, they are, they, they are just, uh, you know, very inspiring moments of trans-regional solidarity coming out from the labor in the UK, from many of the left parties and various other parts of the global north. But this is the systematic crippling of the left politics in the global north and the urge to de-internationalize their political struggles. That is one of the obstacles in our way to demand the global justice and the eventual uh, debt cancellation. I might have something more to contribute in the second half, but I'll leave the floor to Aisha now. Thank you, Bilal. Um, Seb, and you have already said what is needed to be said on that, but I would continue from where you two began and then we'll try to add in a few points that um, I had in mind. Well, um, I would again begin with the historical point, uh, which Bilal mentioned, which said mentioned that um, uh, we, we, we have been talking about these economic and these political systems and these histories of domination. And uh, it all begins from the setting up of those trade routes across the oceans and making this planet one and this connection of the planet, um, we all agree, was um, raci racially organized. And um, this new world, how the world worked, uh, it had some social advantages and again, some disadvantages and the advantages in terms of um, wealth, in terms of state capacity, in terms of the tangible and intangible resources, they all got distributed towards the global north, as Bilal also mentioned, and the disadvantages of all that, the economic dis disadvantages and the disadvantages like pollution, they all tend to accumulate in those times and till date to the racially disadvantages communities in the global south. And uh, the question of reparations again is as old as the history of colonization and uh, along with the slavery, uh, along with the dispossession of the indigenous people of their lands, of their natural resources. The, the world that we live in, the, the area that we belong to, this, the world um, that we inhabit in South, it is built on this on these evils and since we now talk about the reparations we need to see how we can rebuild it and um, it has this history as Bilal also pointed out this has uh, changed the ecology first and foremost it has uh, changed where water and alongside trash would flow who's going to get clean water, who's going to have access on the clean water. It changed the nature of the climate overall. And um, there, there um, are these um, scholars who've started calling this um, racial capitalism because of course it makes sense. Um, this has caused this um, energy revolution again in um, and Recently, Pakistan saw this catastrophic climate uh, disaster in form of flood. And uh, when we um, talk about the future, when we talk about tomorrow, uh, tomorrow's food security again depends on, it, it is built on this history that we, we've all tried to talk about. And we all agree, the participants and the speakers, we all agree and, uh, many who have been affected. You all agree that we need to now reconstruct the food system, we need to reconstruct the water system, we need to most importantly reconstruct the uh, energy system. But the question is whether we can and we should aim and target uh, debt reconstruction as well. So is that possible? Uh, can we target that? Should we aim for that? Because uh, Current global political and economic systems, they protect disproportionately um, the white, they protect disproportionately the rich, and then they protect disproportionately the women. 
uh, the, the, the mail. And then we would uh, take on the perspective in, in which direction we need to take it further. And um, since people of the South, since people who belong to our part of the world, we've contributed least to these catastrophic, uh, these climate crises, uh, we bear the great, greatest impact. And um, now we urge um, and target and aim that the ones who created it, they are under the obligation to address these problems um, since they, since these, these crises, they, they share those colonial roots, we would ask for the reparations from the ones that were responsible for it. And um, I would like to, uh, first of all, mention a few things uh, in this context, and then I would talk about the female perspective, the women perspective. So projects like, uh, in Pakistan, there have been these projects like Rico Dick, in which uh, there has been this mining of copper and gold resources, there are these coal mining projects, there are these other projects, and we don't have, as people and public of Pakistan, we don't have the access to who signed the project with which international shareholders. Uh, the major shareholders are the international organizations, and uh, they extract these resources and they leave those climatic uh, disasters to the, uh, to the working class to face later on. And uh, this is all again connected to the women perspective that I would like to now talk about because uh, women, they pay a disproportionate heavier burden of taxes, of debt, and of the economic conditions that the countries face. And this climate justice and the Debt justice is a feminist issue. It's, a, it's, it's an issue that can be seen, that should be seen in this perspective as well. In our part of the world, um, women's unpaid labor and um, discounted labor, uh, it should be the central conception of the remaking of the world that we are aiming at. And um, um, in these times of uh, neoliberal globalization, women are more marginalized in the already marginalized communities. And um, so debt and, debt and climate justice is more important for women. Uh, they are in more uh, precarious conditions. There is this lack of protection for their labor rights. The environment has more negative impact of, uh, on them. I have seen women in our rural areas, they need to travel farther uh, to, to get an access to uh, safe, uh, water to drink. So they have to go and fetch that. Um, they have to travel farther. There is this dearth of public health services. Uh, maternal mortality, mortality rate is very high. Uh, girls drop out uh, from schools is very high in our areas of women in the global south, particularly in Pakistan. They are, they are poorer than men. And uh, when we talk about um, Regardless of it being uh, uh, seen in the in the terms of gender, every child born here owes almost around five hundred dollars at the time of birth. So when the countries uh, like Pakistan they get uh, loans, these uh, loans are consumed by a small elite and the working class, that is the majority of population, it has to pay back the money that it did not borrow and it did not consume. And um, people here, particularly women, they receive less food, they receive less education, they receive less health care, they benefit less from the military uh, uh, expenditures. So why should they bear the burden? And um, the loans, of course, are a trap. We all agree to the economic dependent countries. We should target the gender just economies. We are a climate uh, vulnerable country. We recently saw a catastrophe, uh, and we need decades to come out of it. So we, we, we. We shouldn't, at the end, I would like to conclude by saying that we shouldn't be paying the price of what we have no active role in. And uh, since there is this uh, heavy disproportionate burden on women in terms of 
debt and in terms of uh, climate. Hence, they deserve uh, more climate and tax and debt justice. I would like to conclude here and then maybe later on contribute more. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, um, Aisha and Bilal, for the, um, the devastating but necessary um, story of how colonial dynamics um, have laid the foundations and structures that, as Aisha so um, illuminatingly put it, um, have led to the um, systematic and structural accumulation of disadvantages disproportionately affecting certain groups. Um, and I'm really sitting with that compelling um, invitation for our world making reparative restorative project to be internationalist, to be feminist and to be um, um, uh, a call to, to, to address the imbalances and, and the inequalities. Thank you so much for, for those interventions and yeah, I look forward to hearing you again when, when, when um, we, we go to the Q&A. I'd now like to welcome um, uh, Danusha uh, and Swastika to please um, give us your perspectives and, 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 and insights. Hi, uh, Swasti, you want to? No, you go, go, you, you go first. Yeah. All right. So uh, following on the same path which the earlier speakers laid down, uh, I would also like to frame this uh, crisis, which is uh, you know popularly framed as a, a, a crisis of overborrowing of foreign denominated debt, foreign exchange debt, uh, and basically uh, in investing that borrowed funds in uh, unproductive or absolutely wasteful infrastructure projects and then ultimately ending up being uh, uh, absolutely insolvent and defaulting around 51 billion in foreign debt this is the case of sri lanka this is how it is portrayed like you know in the mainstream but um, i would like to uh, basically frame this issue as a as an issue which was uh, engendered by uh, by uh, by capital flight uh, I would like to uh, quote a few figures uh, which would basically uh, explain this position. So uh, now if we take Sri Lanka's debt of 51 billion, which we defaulted, uh, around only 20% of it, which is also a significant amount, 20% of it has gone into these infrastructure projects, uh, the so-called wasteful infrastructure projects. Largely, by and large, most of the debt uh, constitute uh, debt that was basically borrowed to sustain or support the balance of payments. Now, uh, now, why I would like to frame this as an issue of capital flight is that now recently, and even the institutions the, like United Nations and World Bank have highlighted this issue of trade misinvoicing and capital flight from uh, basically underdeveloped countries towards the uh, metropolitan or capitalistically developed uh, countries in the uh, in the Western world, basically attracting this money into their financial markets and so on. So, uh, to quote a few figures about this on in terms of Sri Lanka, uh, this particular research institution based in Washington called Global Financial Integrity have put out a report in December last year. They are basically showing that through this method of trade misinvoicing, basically the, the local business elite involved in uh, exports and imports have transferred out roughly $40 billion between 2009 to 2018. So what we have defaulted right now is 51 billion. And so that particular amount of uh, itself constitutes about 80% of what we have defaulted. And uh, then to just to give you a picture of how bad this looks. Now, any economy looks into its current account uh, balance to see whether the external sector reaches some sort of an equilibrium. So Sri Lanka's 
external or the current account deficit. I mean, it has been in deficit for so many years. So during this particular period, it was averaging around 2 billion. But the average uh, of capital flight through this method alone, I'm quoting just trade misinvoicing here, is around $4 billion per year. So almost twice the deficit that uh, Sri Lanka has experienced during this period. So uh, it goes without saying that if the, uh, if the intensity of flight, capital flight was half of what we had experienced, Sri Lanka wouldn't be uh, facing this devastating situation right now. Uh, so now what this has amount to is a complete collapse of the currency and also a tremendous increase in interest rates and, uh, and run, uh, we have been experiencing runover inflation, especially of essential goods and uh, uh, a devastating shortage of essential goods like medicine, fuel and uh, essential food items. Um, so uh, what we can basically uh, see through this data is that Sri Lanka has been experiencing, now we, we just uh, focused on this period between 2009 to 2018. And this particular report also only quotes uh, one out of three main methods of uh, capital flight through trade misinvoicing. Uh, I won't go into what trade missing invoicing is because that would take quite a bit of time. So uh, only one only one mechanism has been uh, analyzed and estimated. So uh, there are two other mechanisms, which, what we call uh, trade missing invoicing through uh, letters of credit system. Uh, now they have only taken into account the open account system of uh, importers and exporters, how they miss invoice and then uh, use that as a method to drive uh, drive out capital from the economy. The other method is through the services. Now, all, the last two methods have not been explored by this report. So it goes without saying that this amount 40 billion is a gross underestimation. So what this means is that not just Sri Lanka, uh, as the earlier speakers highlighted, the underdeveloped world in general compared to the amount of debt it has been borrowing and the amount of aid that it has received through, uh, 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 through the advanced uh, developed capitalist countries, compared to the amount of borrowing and aid, the flight of capital uh, through, uh, from these economies is much far, far more greater. Now, for instance, United Nations, at, uh, this is UNCTDA, they have very recently put out a report on this particular issue alone uh, about Africa. The African continent is losing uh, roughly 89 billion per year. And that is it's a tremendous amount. Uh, when you consider that that amount of capital is flying out uh, per year from, from the continent. So if we add up these, uh, uh, these amounts that have been flying out of these economies and compare it with the amount of debt and aid that these countries have received, it is much more greater. So uh, that means to say that the, uh, these so-called indebted countries are actually uh, are not, not uh, debtors, but in fact are net creditors to the rest of the world, especially to the advanced Western countries. Uh, if we take the flow of capital into account and um, well, then I would also like to highlight the fact that not just the flight of capital through trade missing voicing uh, that has escalated this problem. Yeah, there is also the issue of tremendously low wage rates of the export sector specifically and the economy uh, taken as a whole compared to the Western Europe or the advanced capitalist world where they are enjoying the fruits of labor of these regions at tremendously dirt cheap prices. Uh, well propelled by, assisted by the, the low wage system, which uh, the underdeveloped countries have been uh, experiencing or are basically um, uh, are not finding a way out of it. So now if we compare the, if we say the wage rates and the prices which the underdeveloped countries receive through their exports into the Western world, is uh, at a comparative level to the prices and wages of the advanced capitalist countries. 
the inflow of foreign exchange and value into this region would be tremendously higher and it would uh, it, yeah, so this type of a debt crisis would not even materialize and uh, even this borrowing would not even be required uh, so there is the issue of uh, wage rates the disparity in wage rates for equal amount of work done now we know the fact that there is a tremendous gap between labor productivity in advanced capitalist countries and the underdeveloped world but there are also sectors which the labor productivity is equal especially in the services sector where it is very difficult to mechanize so the labor productivity across regions tends to be the same but the payment of wages in the advanced countries are of course much higher compared to countries like us so this uh, arbitrarily low wage or, uh, rate of wages which ultimately suppress the amount of capital that is flowing into the region is again a fundamental question a fundamental problem which has also escalated uh, this crisis in debt i mean this debt crisis is um, uh, you can say it, it is just a manifestation where underlying problems are uh, are, are elsewhere so with that uh, i would like to say this issue of debt cancellation is not some some charitable some charitable uh, uh, event but it is it, it should be economic justice and uh, the uh, the fact that these underdeveloped countries also including sri lanka are framed as net debtors should be that perspective should be reversed uh, it's almost as if the, the the perception itself is basically sprinting on its head so uh, so we need to change that and uh, of course as a as a long term solution there there needs to be economic planning once some uh, uh, some relief uh, some relief measures are actually initial relief measures are implemented so um, i would like to leave it uh, leave the uh, the whole uh, uh, my presentation there and open for discussions thank you so maybe i would uh, start off by um, uh, borrowing what danusha said as um, economic justice because uh, the the debate which is going on in sri lanka in terms of uh, debt cancellation uh, in recently there has been a undp report where undp says that there are 54 countries are struggling with some form of a debt crisis or this is entirely a mad made crisis so the debate which is going on in sri lanka which i think it's a it's it's not a widespread debate but within uh, circles is that whether we we should go into a debt cancellation or a debt restructuring and then go back to the same mode of uh, production and the same mode of consumption and the same mode of uh, um, economic structuring so to speak or we need to because we have come into this crisis and this has been a long long time i mean the word used was neo colonialism right so debt is one of the ways in which uh, third world countries have been controlled so to speak uh, by uh, by developed nations so whether we need to move into a different form of uh, uh, politics and a different form of economic structuring and a different mode of even production or the arrangement of the economy so to speak so that is a debate which has been going on and uh, in in spaces inside sri lanka particularly because particularly after sri lanka decided to um, default on its uh, 51 billion uh, debt and the the practical side of a country like sri lanka which is entirely dependent on uh, commercial borrowings now sri lanka was uh, in a low income uh, status up until early 2000s and then the world bank um, upgraded it to middle income status so until that point we were getting concession concessionary loans from Uh, multilateral organizations but afterwards we started uh, borrowing from the international uh, commercial international supply market and then um, our borrowing a commercial 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 loan percentage uh, between let's say 2004 to 2019 in, uh, almost increased from 2.5% to almost uh, 56% so what happens to a country which has arranged its production and arranged its economy on a heavy borrowing from the Uh, uh commercial international commercial markets so and when you when you structure an economy around that type of uh, uh, borrowing and and paying and borrowing and paying 
and then suddenly you go into a crisis because of bad uh, economic management due to uh, events like, for instance, the COVID crisis. And then you, you have no way of paying back your uh, debt, so you default. And then everyone around you, all the nations around you, countries around you, uh, lenders around you start terming, terming you or raising questions uh, on your credit worthiness. But it is a sudden decision. In April this year, government decided to default. So at that point, what do you do? What happens to a country when a country's entire economic structure is based around uh, borrowing and then suddenly decides to default? And it has catastrophic consequences to people in Sri Lanka, particularly workers who have been uh, for generations affected by low wages, uh, poor living conditions, bad housing, and so on, and poverty levels, high poverty levels. So when you when because we we work on because I'm a trade unionist and we work on the ground. What you see on the ground is, for instance, food inflation over ninety percent, and workers start skipping meals, families start skipping meals, children don't go to school because uh, mothers don't have something to give them early in the morning. Then when when the IMF comes and says our energy production is unsustainable, uh, it is loss making. Our energy sector is loss making. Then as a response to that almost like a scramble, what happens is, uh, for instance, the electricity board increases the prices of electricity. So that also affects uh, low-income uh, families, particularly workers whose wages have stagnated for various reasons. Then, of course, when you go into hospitals, essential medicines are lacking. If you go into cancer hospitals, life-saving medicines we cannot uh, import. So this is the catastrophic consequence of a country like Sri Lanka, and of course, there are several other countries, but a country like Sri Lanka, which has, which has uh, arranged its economy uh, in this whole uh, uh, taking loan and paying back loan uh, uh, kind of way, and then it suddenly decides to default, there is uh, catastrophic consequences on the ground. So the debate, when, when we talk about uh, economic justice, and when we talk about debt forgiveness, we are also thinking about trade unions, as trade unions, we are also thinking about what is the, what is the light of, how do we come out of this dark tunnel? And do we want to go back in a loop into what is existing right now? That is, we, we are entirely dependent on uh, commercial borrowings at high interest rates. And we have no control over, for instance, um, our food production. It is only after we went into this debt, uh, we decided to default and our foreign reserves uh, came to a dangerous low level that our country, our government actually started putting import restrictions. But even when we started putting import restrictions last year, which was too late, but even at that point, I remember the GSP plus team uh, came to Colombo and as trade unions, we went and told them, whatever you do, do not push the government to uh, relax these import restrictions because this is life-saving. This is, we are at a life-saving mode. This was last year. Despite that, despite the fact that they knew of our economic uh, situation, the GSP plus team, did say, did uh, encourage the government to start uh, restricting or start uh, start uh, relaxing on import restrictions, despite the fact that the next year we started, we went into a food crisis, when we went into a med medicine shortage and so on. So the, the question which I want to raise is, do we want to, at the end of all of this, do we want to go back into this, what we are already in? What, what is the result of this crisis? How did we end up in this crisis? And I think these questions have to be uh, seriously reflected on, particularly when it comes to uh, developing nations in terms of uh, monetary policy, in terms of, now Danusha was talking about capital flight. So do we have more control over how do we control our finances? How do we control our uh, monetary inflow and outflow? Do we have, we as developing nations, do we have control over that? Do we have control over, for instance, our food and our food production? There are debates and discussions going on about food sovereignty after this crisis. And then of course, about how we control trade and how much control and sovereignty a developing nation should have on its trade. That is also an important discussion which, which is going on. So I want to tie all of this to this, to this uh, political, I would call it a political debate and discussion on debt forgiveness. Sri Lanka needs it, Pakistan needs it, so many other countries need it. But at the same time, we also have to look at how do we talk about economic restructuring of the globe so that the, the global south does not continue to uh, lose out and continue to be uh, underdeveloped uh, in the in a, in a global sense. Thank you. Wow, Swastika Danusha, thank you so much for for your interventions. Um, I'm just going to repeat that that final in, in, invitation, which um, 
I'm really sitting with because it's so powerful. In the face of these deep inequalities and this lack of control and this lack of sovereignty around financial flows, around trade, on food, um, on wages and, and employment, what good is a, a call for um, debt cancellation or debt forgiveness if it's not rooted in economic justice um, so that we don't go back to a system of that nature? That is um, such a powerful in, in invitation and intervention. Um, thank you, Sastika. Um, we now want to move on to um, um, so, so, uh, a Q&A. Um, so I would just invite everyone to turn their videos on. Um, hi. <laughs> and basically, there is one question that I'd, I'd like to pose to everyone. There's, a, there's a, a question that's specific to Bilal, but I think you can re re respond um, individually. But the question that has been posted so far in, in, in the chat is basically about um, the, the, the Jubilee debt campaign of the early 2000s and uh, kind of the, the, the movement strategies that you think would help to mobilize such a movement, but critically and crucially, I think along the lines of what Bilal was suggesting, link it to internationalism and, um, or not link it, make sure it's founded and grounded in um, uh, a justice oriented uh, internationalism, but also that responds to kind of the, 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 um, the compelling nature or, or the compelling time frame that the climate crisis poses on this on the situation. So maybe that's a, a good point to, to start and, and I'd welcome your, your thoughts. Um, I don't know who wants to take that on. Um, yeah, I think this also in a way uh, sums up this discussion. The question is very much related to the kind of contribution each contributions each of us has been making. I'm, uh, I feel bad about the fact that I am not really, um, you know, I haven't read much about this uh, 2002 victory, but uh, broadly speaking, uh, this goes on to show that whether it is the colonial powers, the colonial infrastructures siphoning out trillions of dollars from United India, or the post-colonial or the sort of, uh, you know, the 20th century imperialist powers subjugating the vast communities of people in the global south to uh, wars and conflicts uh, time and time again in a in quite an unfitted fashion. It is the combination of the colonial and imperial infrastructures that has been at the heart of the history, at least for the last 300 years. And that is the kind of history that has resulted into uh, this really inescapable situation, of uh, this multiplicity of crises that, crises that the third world finds itself in, whether, whether it is the debt crisis, the inability to deal with the climate crisis, the inability to sort of focus on uh, the, uh, the, the public health infrastructures, the public education and so on. So the, it, it's quite a crippled situation in which these countries in the global south find themselves in. I again don't want to discount the agency of the local actors or sort of exempt the local actors of responsibility. But again, as I mentioned in the very start, we need to take a systematic view of the, of the global uh, infrastructure of uh, international imperialist powers. And there we actually have a great bit of clarity uh, about how the history has been panning out and how communities in the global South has been subject to how these international power relations uh, has been uh, uh, unfolding themselves. So yes, absolutely, we need to have an internationalist outlook all of us, whether it is the left or the progressive uh, movements or any of the progressive projects in the global south, but also equally in the global north. So we need to probably develop a trans-south, trans-north, trans trans-regional 
kind of alliances uh, and movements uh, to deal with the severity of the crisis. And very quickly to someone who invited to about to, to a webinar uh, concerning uh, local climate action, very happy to participate in it. Thank, thank you for that, Bilal. Um, there is another question that's come through. Um, if I can maybe read out, because it's not on the chat or well, um, the questions yet. So um, the crisis of Sri Lanka is also a crisis of foreign reserves, um, which is an issue that does affect many global South countries um, who don't have control over foreign currencies. Um, their own national currencies are weaker. Um, so not used for international trade. So there was a question around that issue and maybe how countries in, in the South can come out of that cycle of dependence, a rather big question. I don't know whether um, anyone would like to comment around that, that aspect. Anusha, would you like yeah. yeah, I couldn't follow. It was the could, was not really audible, Ruth. Sorry, it's a, a Jackie has posted in the in the chat now, so um, you might be able to see it. So ah. the crisis of Sri Lanka was also a crisis of foreign reserves, which arises yeah. and affects many countries that don't have control over foreign currencies, and their own currencies are, are weaker, so not used for for tr international trade. So a question around that issue and maybe how to come out of that sort of bit of a vicious cycle in terms of dependence what swastika was mentioning around that um cycle of um the situation we're in how do we get out of that we just were talking around debt cancellation but maybe other um aspects yeah yeah okay so yes um Yes, first of all, I think we need to frame or understand this question of uh, uh, the crisis in the foreign exchange market as a liquidity trap in the foreign exchange market, where the normal monetary policy mechanisms like interest rates and exchange rate alterations are incapable of affecting the capital flight or the capital flows that is basically all underdeveloped countries are experiencing. So the the question of foreign reserves actually becomes secondary because it is the flows uh, inflows and outflows which we have to actually look into which ultimately ends up being reserves or depleting reserves or increasing reserves so first we have to look into the um, inflows and outflows and what are the factors which are actually influencing these inflows and outflows so uh, the fin uh, in order for a country like Sri Lanka to get out of it, first of all, I mean we, me, Swastika, and uh, you know our people who are really concerned about this issue have talked about these matters. So initially, the Sri Lanka is also facing right now uh, a, a crisis of non-repatriation of export incomes also. So uh, central bank has been quite vocal about this issue and a uh, few activists have been also raising this issue. The, the fact that uh, Sri Lanka is right now uh, is having the largest or highest export income in its history. This is not a fact that is highlighted anywhere. Uh, we're connecting that to the crisis also. So the export incomes in the first nine months have been, as I said, has been the highest in, in Sri Lanka's history. And at the same time, Sri Lanka, it's a, it's a precarious situation. At the same time, Sri Lanka is facing, it's uh, argu arguably the, the most intense foreign exchange liquidity shortage, which it has faced. Certainly it is the worst since, probably it is the worst since uh, independence. So while its export incomes are at the highest level, Sri Lanka is experiencing a shortage of foreign exchange to the extent that it can't even import uh, the, the most essential goods that are required for its working class to, um, to be, um, you know, to attend to work at least. So now, so there, there is an issue of um, these incomes not flowing back into the country or non-repatriation, so which is again a problem of uh, of capital flight. 
and uh, liquidity crisis in the foreign exchange market where the central bank is incapable of attracting these incomes which are already generated and already accrued to the economy through adjusting its uh, policy mechanism. So monetary policy has become inactive or rendered inactive in this situation. So uh, in such a situation, the idea basically comes through Keynes and then it developed uh, in the 1970s after uh, economists explored what happened in the country, um, countries like Africa and Latin America, a lot of research and uh, literature is, is written about this problem. Uh, so um, it is quite wrong to pose, um, you know, uh, pose the problem as the country itself is unproductive and it is not generating incomes, even the incomes that are being generated are flowing out through various mechanisms out of out, out of these regions. So, you now to put this into into more perspective, now for instance that for even the foreign like I said in my presentation earlier that uh, only twenty percent of Sri Lanka's debt is in the form of uh, foreign uh, for I mean the foreign debt out of that twenty percent is in the form of uh, in the form of infrastructure projects. The rest is for, uh, um, as the question correctly asked, it, it is for boosting the foreign reserves. But despite boosting the foreign reserve, these foreign exchange have been flowing out of the country through the mechanism that are active in the foreign exchange market. So without leaving any trace of what was borrowed within the economy as assets, these borrowed funds are also flowing out of the country. For instance, Sri Lanka's uh, foreign assets position is around 36 billion dollars where uh, sorry its uh, foreign liabilities position is around 36 billion dollars whereas its assets position is only around 8 billion so it's very clear that the foreign debt which we have incurred has in the form of liabilities has not in turn led to an increase in uh, foreign assets in the economy so without uh, without having a, without being fixed within the country, these sums have been flowing out, and on top of that, the country has to repay that money also, and that money has been flowing out again into uh, uh, mostly the Western European financial markets, which their financial markets are about ten to fifteen times larger than their real economies, so it has more capacity to absorb these type of flows. Um, so we need to initially address this issue of capital flight and foreign exchange liquidity trap. And then only uh, countries like Sri Lanka would find capital to launch its own economic planning without having foreign exchange at least to import, uh, import uh, the necessary items, even in very small quantities. Uh, Sri Lanka cannot basically uh, envision uh, envision to get out of this crisis and let alone think about an economic uh, plan um, which is uh, focused towards, uh, as, as Swastika earlier mentioned, uh, 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 to addressing the issues in the mode of production itself, to re restructure its capital base, its capital structure, which is absolutely necessary uh, to, uh, to uh, to ensure the well-being of the, the the masses themselves so first we need to address this issue of capital flight immediately that is the that is the number one priority and some at least some some uh, some portion of this uh, of this capital that is flown out must be repatriated and that repatriated uh, capital should be again reinvested um, in an industrial plan where it is addressing the more structural, more, more deeper structural issues in the economy. So, um, um, and that of course is a more complicated issue, but initially to, uh, to get out of this foreign exchange liquidity problem, we really need to address the issue of capital flight and uh, these non-repatriation non of export incomes. Thanks so much, Danusha, for that kind of really detailed explanation. I, um, yeah, I learned a lot. I learned a lot from it myself, actually. Thank you. Um, there was one more question, actually. Um, 
which I'm just going to share. Um, and it says, I am concerned that any country trying to apply for debt restructuring or cancellation may be penalized because of their credit rating, um, and it, uh, which could be harmed. What are your thoughts on this? Um, I know Swastika was already kind of referring to that in, 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 to some extent with the, the dependency and borrowing. Um, but yeah, I, I invite any further comments or, or thoughts on, 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 on this issue. Um, if I, I, I won't uh, give a, like a long answer on this, but just to say that the, the debt crisis, as, as this recent report had said, it, it affects 54 countries. So it's, it's, a, it's a problem which is affecting uh, several countries and it's not a problem of Sri Lanka, it's not a problem of Pakistan, it's, it's, it's about the way how economies are arranged. Uh, to, to benefit the section of uh, uh, countries and uh, to, to uh, negatively impact another section, another, another group, so to speak. So the debt cancellation demand is not a demand of Sri Lanka or not a demand of Pakistan. It should be a collective political demand. And even though this might sound very um, small, one of the, each time I think of Sri Lanka's debt crisis, I think of the uh, internal debt struggles or the internal debt cancellation struggles, which, which goes on with, for instance, uh, victims of uh, microfinance loans uh, in Sri Lanka. So uh, we have had a severe issue where microfinance companies have uh, given predatory loans to uh, particular to women. And uh, there has been a, 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 a severe situation where, where entire villages have gone into a serious issue of debt and, and uh, uh, which has resulted in suicides also. So this, this was going on for some time. And then in the last few years, women have gotten together and they have taken forward a political campaign of debt cancellation. And that has yielded some results in terms of the central bank stepping in and so on. So the, the issue of debt cancellation is not an issue of a country and it's not an issue of a country's uh, uh, credit worthiness or what happened or the nitty gritties or the, or the, what, what shall I, the technical details of it. It is a political issue. And I think if we take it forward as a political issue, there is a chance that we might move into a uh, different, if we do it correctly, we might move into a different form of how the world economy uh, is arranged. That's all I want to say on that. Bilal maybe might be able to comment on. No, I actually completely agree and I might be coming to the same conclusion. I mean, you see, ha have we noticed that the discussion around debt cancellation um, has increased in the, in, the, in the previous years? And why is that so? I think because the the frequency of economic or climate related calamities has increased tremendously and now we are in a in a position uh, that where the imf itself has categorized i think over about 30 33 countries as uh, heavily indebted poor countries which is uh, quite an understatement because as swastika mentioned there are already about 50 of them which are completely unable to pay any of these debts and soon more countries will, will join the list. So we are here in a situation where there is complete inability and where the solutions uh, put forth by the liberal democratic states as well as the global financial institutions will either be to delay the uh, to sort of uh, you know to delay the process or to sort of partially uh, 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 you know, relieve them of their uh, debt obligations or to in a way categorize these countries into sort of certain tiers, country A, country B, country C, the most heavily indebted, the sort of, uh, you know, the secondarily indebted and so on. So in a way, putting us in a situation where, um, where, where these are nothing but absolute distractions distractions not allowing us, the, the activists, the, the political workers, the movements on the ground, distractions not allowing us to focus on the real question. And the real question is, what are, these, what are the conditions that produce these crises of debt in the first place? Thanks so much for that, Bilal. And yeah, um, I think that also spoke, speaks to uh, uh, a, a point that Aisha was making earlier on um, about the kind of the, the world making project 
um, that goes back to this question of um, the the conditions or or or, or as, as Swastika framed it, the the the, the political questions um, about the our global economic system. So I'd just like to maybe, um, in the interest of time, we have about ten minutes left. Maybe bring Aisha back to speak to that a little bit in terms of that framework for reparations that which you set out um, right at the beginning. I am sorry, I couldn't hear you properly, but what I got uh, is that you want me to conclude on the rep uh, reparation part. Yeah, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, all right. So reparation has to be uh, multidimensional. As we talked about, we talked about these uh, racial lens and this gender lens, and this economic lens and all these lens, they need to combine together uh, and then we need to come up with a final conclusion and a final uh, a way forward. And again, um, for that, we need to uh, put our economies uh, into question in terms of where and how these uh, contracts are being signed regarding the natural resources and uh, these big elites that, uh, who are responsible for signing those that deals and um, then the working class not getting any benefit out of it. And uh, again, we need to conclude towards this uh, collective movement against, um, against this uh, uh, unequal distribution. The burden is uh, borne more by the working class and uh, the benefits are consumed by the elite of these countries. Uh, not particularly Sri Lanka and Pakistan, the other South Asian countries. And we need to come up with, with, a, with a collective drive against this uh, injustice uh, and against this unequal distribution. So yeah, I think uh, that that's all I have to say in this regard. Thanks so much, Aisha. Um, I'm aware that um, there was a sudden power cut in uh, Sri Lanka. Um, but I would maybe um, like to invite all our, our, our speakers as a, as a way of closing this space um, for their final thoughts, their final interventions. I, I feel like this has been such a, um, um, a systemic a conversation about the systems and the structures and the history and how debt justice exposes um, and, and, and and, and makes clear the connections between the ways in which the global uh, and political um, and, uh, and economic system functions. I, so yeah, I wanted to just invite um, a, a round of final reflections before, before we close. Um, so please, maybe Danusha, I see your video is on. I'm sorry, my connection is really unstable. I couldn't exactly follow. Uh, you want to round it up? What? Uh, any inputs? Yeah, I would like to add something about, since it's about debt cancellation, something about the debt restructuring program that is going on and the geopolitical uh, aspects that are basically influencing, in, or in, influencing the whole process. One is that now Sri Lanka has been sued by this particular uh, United States based uh, research, uh, uh, investment bank uh, called, uh, I forget the name of the bank. So they, they have um, uh, sued the country for, um, uh, for defaulting uh, the ISB that was due this year, July for a sum of face value of around 250 million US dollars. So um, now we have seen the experience of Argentina where vulture funds have been collecting these ISBs which were defaulted. So basically debt assets. So they are buying up these debt assets and then uh, trying to find loopholes in the agreements, the mutual agreements in the ISBs and then getting these governments. So they're buying it at very cheap prices once they are defaulted and then suing this government for not repaying and asking for the face value. 
So in 2014, uh, this happened in Argentina, if I'm getting the year correctly. So it had to pay around US dollars 2 billion uh, for, um, uh, ultimately they had to pay around 2 billion, whereas the investment by this particular vulture fund was uh, around one tenth of that figure. So similarly, we are also suspecting that is the case here also, because there is something called the collective uh, action clause in these agreements where 70% of the bondholders uh, should agree to a particular conclusion when uh, that, that, that position of that particular instrument is in default status. So, but uh, before that, that clause was not there in these agreements. So these particular vulture funds were able to take governments to courts and then get them to repay exorbitant amounts, uh, ripping these countries off, uh, exploiting their vulnerabilities. So there is a similar case, I think, is brewing up in Sri Lanka also through this particular uh, Hamilton Bank. That is the name of the bank. They have sued uh, Sri Lanka in, uh, in a New York-based district court asking to pay the face value. And we still, didn't know, we still don't know whether they have bought these bonds after Sri Lanka announced its default status. And if that is the case, they must have purchased this at dirt cheap prices and now asking Sri Lanka to pay the face value. So if that does not go through the whole debt restructuring process that is under the IMF uh, scrutiny and international creditors will be jeopardized. Now that is the system we are obviously, uh, we are facing, the reality we are facing. And on the other hand, the geopolitical aspect is that right now the Chinese are not very keen on supporting this uh, debt restructuring program, and they are trying to push their free trade agreements, right? They're trying to push their free trade agreements, exploiting the current status of the country, uh, exploiting the fact that Sri Lanka is dependent on China's decision on uh, debt restructuring, and trying to push their uh, exports into the country while Sri Lanka is uh, at the same time finding it difficult to import even the most essential goods. So uh, this is the type of uh, um, uh, um, so uh, this uh, vulture funds behavior is not limited to these funds also it it is as i mean we have been talking about colonialism so the modern way of this being practiced uh, is quite striking through this modern uh, diplomatic methods of exploiting uh, countries vulnerabilities so if China is uh, is not supporting this restructuring process, then that will also go to go into a standstill, and the country's uh, position will not improve from there onwards. Yeah. That's Thanks so much for um, that, Anusha. Um, we have a little bit of time, uh, but any final quick um, interventions to close from the rest of our speakers? Swastika, you want to go? Um, just like to add one thing uh, in terms of due diligence. So when uh, Hamilton Bank uh, sued us in terms of uh, uh, in in terms of repayment, one of the things which I noticed in the in 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 the copy of the uh, uh, the plaint which we which was released in our media is that they were mentioning offshore accounts where uh, the president at the time, Rajapaksa, and his families have stored the money. And when I was looking that looking at that, I was thinking. So when when you actually loaned it to a, a sovereign nation like Sri Lanka, you knew that the the leaders whom you were lending the money to were not using it for the purpose of developing the country or for the purpose of the people of the country. And still, you went ahead and loaned it to uh, leaders who have been uh, who have been accused of uh, war crimes and so many other. Um, atrocities. So what happens, What the, the question which I want, want to raise in terms of uh, debt forgiveness and in terms of uh, uh, debt, not even debt restructuring, but in terms of debt justice is that the, the accountability measure should also be, or the, the, the due diligence or the accountability measure should also be looked at the people who are lending. This is in terms of a larger discussion, but also this, this aspect also has been looked at. When you lend to leaders whom you know is not enriching or benefiting the country you're lending to, but enriching themselves. And you, you have that information, which the people of the country do not have. What is your obligation? And what is your responsibility 
uh, towards the country you're lending to. So these these are this is just one aspect which I want to add to the discussion, and uh, that those are my remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Swastika. Um, Bilal, I, and then we'll close with Aisha. Yeah, um, I think speaking of the larger questions, uh, maybe at one point I think we also have to ask this question. I mean, wonderful discussion. The framing has been absolutely right, but maybe I mean questions like questions such as what happens the day after the debt is cancelled? What happens the day after reparations are made? So we need to also be very much vigilant of the fact that this is a system that this is an economy that continues to depend on, on debt and continues to create these crises time and time again. And so on and so forth. Gone are the days when the economy used to be depending on the real economy and the real produce. This is now a globalized, financialized capitalism that we are finding ourselves in. So we have to understand and we have to fight against the conditions that produce these debt crises in the first place. And that is the question where the politics becomes central. So that is the note that I want to leave on. So powerful. Thank you, Bilal. And uh, Aisha, any final remarks? And then we'll close. So yeah, I would reiterate again by saying that Pakistan is most vulnerable these days in terms of climate. And uh, we need to look for measures uh, together to, to combat the, the, these uh, climate crises, uh, crisis across the, uh, the region. And um, at the same time, we need to look for measures in which we could you know, effectively uh, deal and go ahead, as Bilal mentioned, with the future. So once, once it's canceled, what's the way forward? We'd again have those same elite who would again be willing to sign more pacts uh, with the elites of the global north and would the economy stay, uh, I mean, would the status quo be maintained? Um, this debt cancellation would lead to a better future or not? That's the question that needs to be researched upon, that needs to be worked upon, and that needs to be looked at uh, again, um, uh, not horizontally, but vertically. And then we need to, to, to work towards the better future together collectively. Yeah, that's it. Thank you so much, Aisha. Well, with that, I um, just want to thank Aisha, Bilal, Swastika, and Danusha for um, your contributions, uh, for your insights, for the work that you're doing day in and day out, for those radical, visceral invitations that that you've made um, in this um, in, in in this discussion, which I know are echoed um, very much so in this global week of action for justice and their cancellation. So I just want to finish by um, re-encouraging everyone to, to see the statement that's been coordinated by our friends and allies, um, APMDD, um, and to continue following the, these world-making and world-changing uh, discussions about how to restructure and reform and transform and rebuild uh, 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 an economy and a world um, for life. Um, thank you so much for your time, everyone. Thank you for joining, despite the fact that it's been that it's quite late, um, where many of you are joining from. Um, we're so very grateful, and I think we will host uh, a next discussion uh, that starts with that question: What happens the day after we we achieve that cancellation? So thanks for that, Bella. Um, I look forward to uh, speaking there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks thank a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.